Welcome to Fun with Annuities, where every single week I welcome a celebrity guest expert that can help you maximize chapter two of your life. Listen, learn, laugh, and love every minute of the most unique financial podcast on the planet. Let's get to it. Welcome to Fun with Annuities, the number one annuity podcast on the planet. And for that matter, one of the best podcasts on the planet, period, regardless of category. I'm your host, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent, sporting the new popular trend setting annuity goatee, as you see that. Now, the problem is this time is coming in gray, which I blame on the industry for driving me crazy. And that's the reason we have a repeat guest on today. He is, he's so smart about annuities, he's forgotten more than most agents will ever know, okay? But he's also a personal friend and we have a lot of fun outside the annuity industry. You go see concerts and things like that. I'm gonna give away some things his friends don't even know. I might reveal that depending on how much non-payment of uh, bribe money he gives me. Let me introduce to you personal friend, soothsayer, counselor, all around good guy, but the smartest dude on the planet when it comes to annuities, including yours truly, my friend, John Lenz. I don't think I can, I don't think I can say anything that would help that. Thank you, Stan. That's, that's pretty good, isn't it, John? I mean, you can, you know, I've met your lovely wife again, you like me married up, you know, in life. Yeah. Um, and so you probably should just record that and just play it. Or send it to her right before you show up. Yeah, I might do that for both of our wives. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump in, John. It's a, you know, yeah. at the time of this taping, please, everybody check the date. Um, it's a weird world in the annuity industry. As I always tell people, the bell doesn't ring at the top or the bottom with contractual guarantees, but doggone it, at least we can see the bell. Right, John? Yeah. What's going on? Well, it's probably been... <laughs> What another record year for annuity sales uh, in the country. Last yep. year was a record year. Yep. Uh, this year, setting all kinds of new records. Uh, interest rates are high until today. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a record setting year and lots of money moving around in the industry. Money coming in and out of the market, in and out of annuities, in and out of banks. So, yeah, I've been a wild ride. Well, let's talk about rates heading down. Um you know, people always say, well, well, Stan, you know, where are rates headed? And I always, my answer is the same every time. If I knew where rates were going, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be on a Learjet trading interest rate futures with John. Um, but with $34 trillion in debt and counting, and for the conspiracy theorists out there and mathematicians, there's even more than that. As you know, um, common sense would tell you we can't continue to raise interest rates. Otherwise, the whole debt, the whole... Uh, um, amount of money that we raise every year as a country would just go to service the debt. Now, without all that really factual common sense stuff being laid out, John, add to that. Well, COVID sent rates plummeting. Uh, and then as you know, the economy struggled, and as we've worked our way through that, inflation reared its head. There was a lot of money running around out there. And so our inflation rate became unacceptable. Fed raised rates, I believe, 11 times until we got a 10-year treasury pushing 5%, which is, if you think about it, in the low of COVID, I think it traded at 0.6-ish. So 900% increase in three years and a little bit. So that just caused a lot of turmoil in the industry as people started to see three, four, then five, then five plus nearly 6% interest rates in multi-year guarantee annuities, your favorite fare and mine too. Currently, I mean, you know, at, at, you know, at the time of this taping, I always tell, and I just did a video called go, go to the sidelines with contractual guarantees. I mean, MIGA's our contractual guaranteed home run for side, for sideline money, same as money market, same as CDs. Yeah. But anyway, this past week, uh, Fed uh, held rates steady. Today's uh, employment data came out, 150,000 new jobs created. Uh, that's uh, less than expected and in, in line with the cooling economy that I think the Fed's trying to target. So what's going to happen now is there's going to be a rush to lock in these rates 
because the 10 year treasury has fallen 10 percent in its mm -hmm. yield from five to four and a half. So anyway, that's what's going on. And it's been a crazy year. As you know, your office was backed up with annuity processing because our insurance partners were backed up two months or more right. before they could approve applications. We've never they've seen caught that. up. I mean, let's be very clear. I mean, it's a lot better. Um, you know, and you know, my my company being the gorilla in the annuity room, we do have some clout here and using John as well for that clout. But um, yeah, I, I don't think yeah, you know, people are always trying to time it and they're trying to um you know, find that sweet spot or arbitrage moment. You cannot beat the life insurance companies issuing annuities. Please don't try. I know that you think you're smart enough to do that. Please don't try. Um, because John and I, I, I guess between us two, what do we have? 70 years in the business. If we haven't, if we haven't figured it out, Johnny. <laughs> guess yeah, what? It's, uh, there's 70 years uh, between <laughs> us. You're right. There's a few, you know, there's a few things happening. Um, I still think that even though we've hit record sales with annuities, um, I don't think that's going to subside just because of the demographic tidal wave. It might not be MIGAs next year. It might go back to lifetime income products. Do you agree? Yeah, lifetime income products hit a record this year, too. Uh, the, the, the product line that fell, I believe, overall or had the least improvement was variable annuities. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we'd agree rightly so. Uh, you know, the, that fee structure is is mm -hmm. more and more uh, problematic for advisors and customers alike and regulators. Yeah. So when you can get into an annuity with a MIGA with a five, five and a half percent guaranteed net, net, net rate, I mean, why, why risk your money? I agree. And I have nothing against and you don't have anything against um, variable annuities. We talked about it. I mean, heck, we were almost around in 1954 when they came out with variable annuities. I mean, we're old dudes. I know I look vibrant and young and John is close by with that i mean actually yeah. john looks like he's he does john i don't like john for this reason he does not age yeah that I might be, that really might be the, and, the shaving of the head i think that is a, that throws people john i got old early and then i've stayed old young forever so well, that's what i intend to do do you attribute a lot of that to just knowing me uh that's why i don't grow a beard because i don't want a big white thing and, you know, hanging down. john that's the annuity goatee and by the way for all of you out there going out to trademark it, don't. It's already been done. Um, just letting you know. There's a question on my mind, Johnny. Um, why do companies, there's a lot of 1035 transfer business. And for all you people that are really bored, 1035 refers to the IRS code 1035. That would be 1035. That says you can transfer one annuity to another annuity without tax consequences. Why do the renewal rates at the company that people are at why are they not competitive, which leads people and us to recommend moving to another higher contractual guarantee? If you and I were running the, the it would have to be the lens stand, the, the, would it be Stan lens or lens stand? Doesn't matter, no ego. If we're running the annuity company, wouldn't we try to keep the money? Well, if we were running a nonprofit organization, then we would renew everybody at uh, current interest rates, regardless of what our investments were doing. But you know, the, the truth of the matter is insurance companies are for-profit institutions. And, I, you know, I think I want my insurance company to be profitable so that when it comes time to pay a claim, they can do so. But historically, insurance companies have renewed annuities at a lower rate than new money rates. Not everybody and not all the time. And so uh, as you've taught uh, people and, and, you know, I've talked about many times, you've got to look at your renewal rate, Dave, and just keep the company honest. Right, right. And, you know, let's be honest in how the sausage is made. A lot of these annuity companies are hoping that people lose track of it. Their agents lose track of it. Their agents aren't in the business. They're not technically savvy to follow up with it like our team is. I mean, that, to me, it seems like that's part of the strategy. And they're not going to ever admit to that, except in the board meetings that you're in, but you're you're sworn to secrecy, right? It's certainly part of the strategy, and it's not unique to our industry. I'm sure uh, you and other people on your podcast listeners have had a bank account today that is earning 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.4. That's a good and, point. And then they've got a brokerage account at one of the major brokerage firms where they've got cash that could be earning 5% in a U.S. Treasury money market fund, and it's earning less than one. So you have got to advocate 
and go out there and make sure your money is not sitting around uh, making somebody else profit instead of you. It's the procrastination ratio, John. I just came up with that. It's PR. It's the procrastination ratio or the pro procrastination quotient, if you want to be a little bit more quanty about it, that I'm sure some actuary in the closet at some life insurance company goes, well, listen, you know, if we don't do a lower, if we do a lower renewal rate, the 71.3% of the people will just let it renew at that rate, which will bring, I'm assuming that's kind of what's happening. I mean, it's with that same type of voice, right? Yeah, my, <laughs> I know that voice very exactly. well. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's a larger percentage than that. Uh, you know, really? The, oh, well, sure. I think you, I thought I heard you say 1.3%. No, I said 71.3. 71.3. Oh, there we go. I like that number better. And as you and I both know, 67.7% .7 of all statistics are made up on the spot. I thought and, it was 67.8. I didn't know. Okay. Something never mind. like that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, uh, not only do people fall asleep at the switch, but then their advisors yeah. go and retire and die, or they leave the business for you know greener pastures and consumers just forget about it. And that's good for the insurance company. By the way, I'm talking to John Lenz. He is he is a phenomenal person, very good at what he does in the annuity industry. I call him the annuity architect, based in lovely Portland, Oregon, um, which I frequent when there's a good concert. And then I drag John to the concert, whether he likes the music or not, because I'm trying to I'm trying to make him a more rounded person culturally. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, my bruises are gone from the beating I took in the last uh, concert we went the to. The heavy metal. So this is a great story. Off And people, hang in there with us. Okay, I'm standing nutty, Matt. Come on. So we, I took him to some heavy metal concert, and there's this mosh pit with a bunch of crazy people going around. Google mosh pit if you don't know what that means. And I'm talking to, to John, and we're standing in the back because we're old people. And all of a sudden, he's in the mosh pit. I'm like, okay, um, this will be an interesting one to explain to his wife why he has a bloody nose and a black eye, but he survived it because he's athletic, and I like that. My, ver my version of that is I was standing there listening to this music, and I felt two big annuity man hands on the middle of my back, and all of a sudden, I was in the <laughs> middle of a mosh pit, something like that. <laughs> something, yeah, they said the truth is right there in the middle. By the way, Johnny, um, you know, me and you both have, in the in the past, uh, tell people, hey, don't lock in long-term you know, stay short, ladder it short, just because rates will, will move eventually. We want to be there. Well, heck, it, you know, I, I did a video the other day called it might look, might make sense to do a long term MIGA ladder going long on the yield curve because MIGAs are not callable. Do you agree with that? Yeah, like you said earlier, if we could predict interest rates, we probably would be doing something else today if we could predict them accurately. Um, would I've we start a band, Johnny? Would we start a band? I mean, that's always been a dream of mine that I'll never do, but I mean. I know. All the cool names are taken, as you know. Uh, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the rates, uh, today the rates are pretty similar between two, three, four, five, all the way out to 10. You know, it's that five, five and a half number. Yeah. And uh, yeah, personally, I don't, I do not know. So I've got some money short, some money intermediate, mm -hmm. and I have some 10 year money. And I'll be super happy if rates go down and look like a genius with my long-term money. And if rates go up and turn around and go back up, I'll wish I would have stayed short. So given that we don't know, having a little bit of a ladder is not a bad idea. Yeah. And I always tell people at the rates, current rates, check the, check the date of this podcast. I will take your call five years from now if you're mad at the rate we lock in today. I'll take it. And I'll just I'll just listen to you. It'd be like the Charlie Brown um, thing went rah, rah, rah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll be okay. Okay, you're mad because you missed opportunity, but you're locked in at whatever five and a half, six percent, whatever. I, you know, I always tell people remember when you go into the markets, what, what yield rational yield you're looking at seven or eight. Please don't come to me with 12 and 13, seven or eight percent. You know, if you're two percentage points away from that, locking it in contractually, please tell me why you're putting your money at risk to get the rest, unless you're just, you know. Gordon Gecko or Gordon, would that be Josette Gecko? I mean, what, regardless, the point is we are at interest rate levels that if you have enough money, you can live off the interest, lock it in long term, and then we'll cross that bridge and pick up the fork in the road when we get there if rates happen to go down and we have to then re do something different at the, at the end of the duration. But I, I think people are making this very, very 
complex. The same ones that go, well, if it goes up, I'm just going to log it in. Those same people are now analyzing, should they lock it in? <laughs> so um, let's talk about liquidity, John. That's a big thing. You know, I like the word liquidity. It can mean a lot of things. I don't drink beer anymore. Back in the day, liquidity meant beer, but doesn't anymore. We're talking about liquidity with, with annuity products. Um, you know, we do that with my team. We have a full team that, that handle MIGA renewals, you know, when they renew, et cetera. But talk about liquidity windows and how people, can, um, you know, if they're not using us, they're going to have to stay on top of it to not get stuck with the annuity company. Put that into English, John. Well, when you buy a, let's just take a five-year MIGA, the insurance company is going to take your premium, your deposit, and they're going to invest that money into something close to five years because they owe you this money. They've created a liability. So now they've got to invest your money in an asset that matches up with the duration. They can't buy a 10-year or a 20-year bond with it, and they owe you the money back in five years. Right. Or would you put it in a, a one-year or money market account because the rates don't match up? So then you get this really competitive rate on the front end. At the end of that term, some companies will simply just leave you alone. You're there. You don't renew. You just get whatever interest rate they have. And it's governed by the minimum rate in the contract. Other companies give you a 30-day liquidity window, which usually starts on your policy anniversary, but could start 30 days earlier. Mm -hmm. You've got to be aware of that. And they'll give you a renewal rate offer. In theory, that offer is going to correlate with the investments the insurance company has at that time. So as you said, you've got a team that keeps companies honest by mm -hmm. looking at those rates. And if the rates are competitive where they stay, they stay. If they're not, they can opt to transfer with a 1035. Bottom line is you got to stay on top of it and manage it just like everything. I mean, I tell people all the time, if you have a trust, you got to revisit the trust on an annual basis, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, nothing's, nothing's turnkey. Nothing's completely lock and load. I mean, you have to you have to look at that. I don't know what that. Do you hear that sound in the background, John? Not happening here. Hmm. Maybe that's in my head, but something sounds like it's blowing up in my office here, and that's oh. okay. If it blows up, John will continue the podcast, and it will probably be a better podcast. And to go down kind of a slippery slope here, John, I'm thinking more about the annuity goatee right now. If it gets longer, do I do different colors? I would. I I've seen it red. I think. Uh, should it yeah. match the hat? <laughs> I should have worn my annuity man hat today, Stan. Because I have different colored hats. And for all the people out there that keep asking me for hats, we're getting them manufactured and we'll give them away, et cetera. Just send us an email. Get on the waiting list. I've got like 300 people on a waiting list for a Stan the annuity man hat. But I don't just send any hat, John. It's got to be a really nice hat with logos all over it. And inside of it, just in case someone picks it up and looks at it. So let's talk about SPIAs. Single premium immediate annuities, John, the granddaddy of all annuities, the one from the Roman times, the one that when people say, I hate all annuities, they're talking about that one for whatever reason. Um, the payout, the payout rates are are very good, you know, even though you know life expectancy does drive the pricing trains, interest rates play a secondary role. What's the um the fact that it's a competitive world out there and companies are trying to attract the money, does that play into it as well? And if so, how much? Well, as you know, this space is super competitive. There are mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of good companies that want to take that deposit, credit interest, try to make a spread, make a profit. There are a lesser number of companies and thank goodness they're mostly the biggest and the strongest of the companies that want mm -hmm. to take your money in now and then promise to pay you for the rest of your life or you and your spouse uh, or significant other right? Uh, for as long as you live, which might be 30, 40, 50 years. So they're turning out and buying these long-term investments, getting in lots of different ages and policyholders so they can right. figure out not when you are going to die, but when the average person is going to die. Right then they take that risk of you living too long, the longevity risk, default risk on the investment. They absorb all of that and make a promise to pay you a payment. It's great. We're seeing rates of return 
as high as six, six and a half percent. And let me All stop you, you there, Johnny. Live let long me, enough. Let me stop you there. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not talking about yield. We're talking about payout rates. So don't let, don't be confused. Well, I'm getting 7.3%. No, you're getting a payout on your money of 7.3%, which is kind of an actual reflection numerically of your life expectancy. I know I had to interrupt you, Johnny, but I get so many calls and there's so much misinformation out there with agents and advisors. I'm not sure they're just dumb uh, uh, misanthropes or they really don't, or sociopaths, or they really don't know. But that's why the podcast is in place and my videos are in place is so that people do understand it. Yeah, so look, I'll clear that up because I was I was talking about both things. So clear it up, brother. If you're 70 some odd and put in $100,000 and get, let's say $700 a month, seven times 12 is 84. That's 8,400 per year on 100,000. So that's, in, like you said, an 8.4% payout. It's not the rate of return you get. But if you live 12 years, now you've got all of your money back. And then you live 13 years, now you have a 1% return. You live 14 or 15 years, you have a 2 3 4% return. You can actually eke that number up to the 6. All you got to do is live out into your 90s. And That's there are lots, lots say, of insurance companies paying people payments at 100 years old. John, I don't know if you know this, but my recent tattoo that I got, that I, you know, they're always underneath the Annuity Man logo stuff. No ROI till you die, right here on the chest. Right, exactly. Right here on the chest. Um, no, I think I, I think I spelled it right, but uh, no ROI till you die is what I tell people. It was a return on it, Stan. What am I getting on that thing? I don't know. Tell me when you're going to die. I've always offered this, John. No one's taken me up on it, which is sad, that I will come to the funeral and sing a cappella the ROI number and weave it into their life story, semi-rap, but with an operatic flair to it. But no one's taken me up on that. I don't sing well, but what I would volunteer to do is to give you a, what would my ROI be if I lived 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, 20 or 25 years, because we can calculate that in advance. Now, then you just pick the day you're going to die and that's your number. So in other words, I could, I could do those songs now. It's always a thought, John, you know, I'm a marketer, I'm a brander. And now the annuity goatee is the newest thing. It hit me the other day. It's like, that's, that would be good. Uh, my wife is not a fan, by the way. She doesn't under, but you know, she wasn't a fan, John, when I started doing video. She goes, videos? Who's going to watch your videos? I don't know, millions maybe. Um, but you know, now she's like, man, those videos were a great idea. <laughs> well, uh, I, I did see uh, that YouTube just uh, announced you as a 10,000 subscriber plaque holder uh with the million plus views that's it is impressive i don't think anybody else in the annuity space comes close to that well first of all let's let's gauge that for in the youtube space that's nothing i mean for the for the for the culture warriors and the and the the influencers that's nothing they get that in a day i get that but the word annuity the curse word of all financial products yes it, we are the top it's not even close and that's the reason that everybody when i told them i'm i'm gonna do youtube videos we've done over a thousand so far in counting shooting another 20 next week in studio. They're like, it's never going to work, Stan. Anytime you tell me that, I'm going to probably do it. I'm such a contrarian. I'm like, really? Great. That means no one else is going to do it. But we're having fun with it. And then the fun with Annuities Podcast, I get people like you on here that make me look good, John. I swear, just you being here with that sport jacket makes me look good. Yeah. Well, you, fun with Annuities is the Gangnam style uh, <laughs> equivalent of uh, podcasts. Google it. <laughs> hey, Johnny Kulax, you know, when they came out in 2014, yeah. I wrote the first book on it. It was not a bestseller, but it should have been, but it has been distributed a lot. I'm a big fan of Kulax just because they do so many things. And for, you know, in Kulax qualified longevity annuity contracts for the people to say, never buy an annuity inside of an IRA. Those people, those journalists, QLACs were, were designed for IRAs, okay? So uh, they need to be quiet. But give us some updates on QLAX, Johnny. Even though I know the answer, you will say it better. Well, the answer is $75,000, Alex. Uh, and what is the <laughs> what is the maximum amount I can put in my QLAC if Wait I put a minute. in- Wait a minute, stop. Where's the I put in 125000 last year. 
Would you bring in Vanna, please? I want to see that dress. So yeah, the uh, the IRS uh, through Secure 2.0, I believe, said now you can put in two hundred thousand dollars into your QLAC, which means you can waive your RMDs all the way to eighty five, get a single or joint lifetime income. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic, and we're seeing a lot of seventy five thousand dollar cases because people mm -hmm. who believe in QLAC already put in their hundred and a quarter. Right, and there's no more formulas. Of course, the government when they first came out, and John and I were, you know. They, everyone asks our opinion. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. We're like, make it simple, make it simple, make it simple. Of course, the first one, it wasn't simple. There's some formula. It was crazy. Now it's 200000 If you have $200,000 in your IRA, you can buy QLAC. And what the government is doing is saying, hey, that other annuity that you own called Social Security, best inflation annuity on the planet, let's, let's add to that income floor using IRA money. That's all they're trying to do. OK, and you should be doing that anyway, because, you know, chapter two of your life is about, you know, going and living your life and lifestyle and the income floor that you establish. And QLAX, the only thing I'm going to say about QLAX is that do not buy QLAX for the tax savings, please. That should be the third reason. First reason is lifetime income. Second reason could be under the first one, which is joint lifetime income if you want to add a spouse. Another reason would be if you want to combat inflation with income starting at a future date, because anytime you attach a COLA or any type of increase, the annuity company doesn't give that away. But then the last reason would be the savings on your requirement of distributions, because the money in a QLAC is not used to calculate RMDs. But people call me all the time, I'm going to buy this just for the tax savings. I'm like, you're going to buy an irrevocable contract and you don't need income for the tax savings? And I always tell people, please stop letting the IRS live in your head for free. QLACs are great, but the tax savings should be, or potential tax savings should be an ancillary, secondary, tertiary choice. Do you agree with me, John? Yes or no? Uh, yes, uh, I do. And sure. I think that the uh, the dead giveaway is, is the uh, name of the contract, Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. So this is people for people who worry about living mm -hmm. for a long time we we recently did a case with a hundred thousand dollar deposit on a guy in his 60s this hundred thousand dollars produced lifetime income at age 85 of over thirty five thousand a year so you put in a hundred and get back a, a series of lifetime payments of 35 grand now before you're like that sounds like too much to me well he had to wait 20 years to get the first right. payment it's and he, he may or may not be alive at 85. Right. But if you're talking to your dad on his 100th birthday, then the odds of you making it out there are high, then these are for you. Well, the other thing that needs to be mentioned with that, that I interrupted you to do in standing annuity man fashion is that now is a dead asset. That asset does not have any interest rate growth. You can structure it so that the money will go back to the beneficiaries if your Learjet hits the mountain before the income starts, or you can, and you can also structure it so that even when income starts and when you die, whatever money's left over goes to the list of beneficiaries of the policy, knowing that um, lifetime income is a combination of return or principal plus interest. So my point is, yes, it is a good ROI, John, as we say, because you know it's, it's a transfer of risk pension, but you are losing opportunity with the money and you have to know this going in. Um, but but if you know that going in and it's allocated properly and in proportion within the portfolio works like a charm, it's when the too good to be true thoughts are entering your head that that's when people get caught. I always tell people when they're young like that, yes, 60 is young for a QLAC, um, I'd say, okay, here's the downside. Here's the downside. Um, and if you're okay with that, then we then we can implement it. But you need to know that it's a downside. You need to know it's a non-liquid strategy. Yep. So love it, but you know, you need to know the benefits and the limitations. Yeah. I, well, I left you speechless. That's unbelievable. I, I have nothing to add to that. We're, That's beautiful. we're, we're seeing them used in primarily in income planning uh, for people who, you know, are worried about Gosh, what happens if I get to age 85 and inflation is eating away at my fixed income? Now they can turn on uh, this QLAC bucket for lifetime income. And worst case scenario is somebody gets your initial deposit back most of the time. 
And, you know, when you're transferring, I'm going to, I'm going to shock you here, Johnny, when you're transferring risk and you're getting peace of mind, would you call that somewhat of a sleep token that you can get, you know, sleep better at night because you have those, that income floor in place? Would you, would you comment on that? Sleep token is the name of a band that Stan and I went to, and uh, we looked like uh, <laughs> parole officers there. Like DEA. Up, we were DEA undercover. Yeah. Someone came up to me and said, you're kind of old to be here. What are you guys doing here? And I said, get away from us. We're undercover. <laughs> and uh, the guy, the guy left immediately. But yes. yes. Yeah. So, but do you like, are you going to intertwine sleep token into some of the presentations? I am not prepared to do that today. I took my uh, sleep token shirt off that uh, got from the merch shirt. Thank you, Stan, the annuity man. Uh, but <laughs> no, I, uh, I could, I could, I will, if you give me a chance at the end, I will come up with some way to intertwine sleep token with my thought for the day. Can you do that with their, the song that I like the best? And then people can start Googling it. I mean, this, this could almost become a cryptic um, podcast. Yeah. This, may, maybe that's the evolution. Let's become too cryptic. Stan and I are working on lyrics to a song that, that says, <laughs> yeah. I'm developed a taste for you now. It's something like that. <laughs> and uh, our SPIA sales are uh, wow. on record levels as wow. we provide guaranteed lifetime income for people. I, I hope we didn't just violate a copyright. I doubt it. I really doubt it. Um, so the agent comes to the the person, sits at their table, shows them the picture of their kids, tries to be their friend, and then says... Well, if you take this upfront bonus, we can get you a better deal. Let's talk about replacing annuities as these rates are rising currently, overcoming surrender charges and what's called market value adjustments and the legalities of that. John, I want you, I want you to hang on the word legality of it because I always tell people upfront bonuses are candy for the stupid. Um, there's not a philanthropist at annuity companies that, that get up in the morning, the CEOs and say, I want to give money away. Have you met any of those CEOs that get up and say that, John? You know, it looks like I'm, there's some sort of vision occurring outside my office. Portland is supposed to be in an atmospheric river today, but instead it's a beautiful sunny day outside and I, I refuse to shut the blind. So those of you are getting knocked out by my, my reflection. I apologize, but uh, I thought that was just your aura. Is, You're like your annuity aura. Yeah, you are getting hit. That's good. The, the insurance industry did not start the bonuses. I take that back to the savings and loan people that said they would give you a free toaster with a deposit. A toaster is not a bonus. A toaster is a toaster. <laughs> so the industry has said, hey, bring us your money and we'll add some money to your account. And as you and I both know, there is no free money. And so what's given away up front generally is taken away uh in succeeding years there's a hundred pennies in the dollar sir <laughs> as they well, say I have that, that, there's that there's that 132 percent dollar that we hear about all the time but no those are uh, those are uh, little carrots and danglers that some people just sort of jump on but at the end danglers. of the day when math uh, <laughs> when, when we do the dangler math, when oh. stan and i do the math we mm. look at the total equation, whether there's a bonus up front or better renewal propositions along the way, so that the end number is highest and guaranteed. Sir, that's a dangler. Do not right. be distracted by the dangler. How many times have I told you that? Um, so I always tell people surrender charges that the com companies do not like accepting other annuities that you have taken surrender charges. The only way that it is even possible to try to attempt to transfer it under that you're taking surrender charges is that mathematically it has to be better where you're and contractually, not hypothetical and theoretical and projecting back testing unicorns chasing the butterflies, mathematically contractually better where you're going from where you're coming from. And even then Johnny, some companies won't take it. Right. Yeah. I and mean, then it's not because the company wouldn't want your money. It's because the regulators uh, are trying to uh, police sales to make sure that an insurance agent's not taking advantage of you yep. by rolling over an annuity that's got a surrender penalty that's not in your best interests. And it's it's rare, but it does happen occasionally where uh, a, an annuity holder can pay a penalty and move and and ultimately end up with a better guaranteed result. But we have to prove that mathematically and go through mm -hmm. a suitability uh, mm -hmm. review at every company. And most companies just 
don't want to be accused of of accepting business that has a surrender charge on it. And that's a recent change in the last what 10 or 10 years or so. No, I agree. It's it's in the business it's called twisting, churning, whatever it's called to me it's you can just label it as bad in most cases. Um so you know be very very careful of the person saying, "Well, you can just transfer and get this up for a bonus and the upfront bonus makes up for it." Um and also understand that if you're transferring say an in, a, a variable or index into with an income rider, the income rider number does not transfer hello be careful um with that being said johnny can you give a very second grade uh, you know annuities for nine-year-old explanation of mbas which stands for market value adjustment no there is no second grade explanation for mba but uh come on I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it down so that I can understand it um, and basically what an MVA is, is just an adjustment to your surrender value that's based on whether interest rates have gone up or down since you purchased your annuity. So annuities that were purchased uh, a year or two or three ago have uh, an MVA that is negative that adds to their surrender charge. But if you bought your annuity a month ago, you now have a positive uh, MVA that would benefit and mitigate your surrender charge because the 10-year treasuries moved from five to four and a half as of today's taping. So it's a surrender charge, excuse me, that helps protect the insurance company's investment because they've got to go out and make a commitment to an investment five to 10 years typically. And if interest rates move or when interest rates move, their investment moves. If interest rates go way up and people want to leave the insurance company and say, hey, insurance company, we want our money back. And the insurance company has to go out and break their investment. They've got a breakage fee and they pass that along as a market value adjustment or MVA. And almost all the competitive MIGA policies have those. Interest rates go up after you buy it. Surrender charges are probably going to go up as well. Can you say yes to that? That is yes. Interest rates go down after you purchase it. Your surrender charges are probably going to go down after after that. Correct? Correct. You're going to have. Hey, a by the way, John, I just NBA. did the nine year old explanation of it. <laughs> okay. Wasn't that beautiful? That was beautiful. It was beautiful. By the way, back to the annuity go to, which is this this even though the title of this is annuity state of the union, which I thought was really good, and I'm not going to tear up the script that you sent to me like. Pelosi tore up Trump's that time because this is so good. But on a serious note, when I when I like do this and for people that are listening, I'm, I'm like stroking the annuity goatee. Does that make me look and appear more more intelligent? Yes or no? I'm taking the fifth on that. Come on. As they say, and I I, I heard this song the other day, it, it said, and I'm, I'm going to apologize up front. You can polish a turret, but you, you can't polish a turret, but you can roll it in glitter. I think that's what it was. You but anyway, think about that. it. So you can't polish a turret, but you can roll it in glitter. And I think that's what John's trying to tell me about the stroking and looking smart with an ascot and a smoking jacket with the annuity goatee. MBAs, we cut. Let's talk about suitability, Johnny. Suitability. Mm. And it has nothing to do with that really fine sport coat. What what label is that? I mean, is that like a Brooks Brothers? What is that? Yeah, my wife made this for me. She's uh, very She adept. made it for you. <laughs> She's a seamstress. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Um, and so resourceful. Even though you have money, you're making your own clothes, is what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah. I can't find anything that will fit me as I'm so old. But let's talk about suitability. Uh, it is It is a big deal. Uh, explain you, that John you, that's a broad that's a 30,000 foot shot take yeah, it down take it down yeah. my brother suitability is a term that says the annuity that your agent is proposing to you is in fact suitable for you based on a number of things your age your liquidity your understanding your money uh your net worth mm -hmm. uh, your income and your expenses so there's sort of a test that, which is why sometimes the application process to buy an annuity feels a little intrusive. So the insurance company needs to know to, to satisfy regulators in your state that the annuity you're purchasing makes sense for you, that it is suitable for you. And as we are making this 
this uh, podcast, there are new suitability regulations being rolled out, especially for IRA money, mm -hmm. that raise that bar that say not only does it need to be suitable, but your agent needs to be doing the very best thing for you possible without any consideration for compensation or his or her benefit. Now, stop for a second. You just defined the word fiduciary, but between me and you, if you're in the financial business, shouldn't you be acting like that, period? Do you have to yeah. put a plaque on your wall? No, and I and I would say that insurance agents in general have always tried to hold to a standard that this is in your best interest. Yes. But it's gotten more challenging, more T's to cross and I's to dot. Uh, and the Department of Labor has kind of picked a fight with the industry over this, you know, calling some things junk fees. But we'll see where this all shakes out. But at the end of the day, uh, insurance agents are going to, be very transparent, disclose how much they're getting paid that day, uh, talk about all the different features in the product, give it to you in writing, get your signature. And then of course the industry has a, we don't want a dissatisfied customer policy. So you've got a 10 day or 30 day or even longer yep. free look period. Yep. Can you ever envision me and you sitting in front of Congress and them asking us questions about the annuity industry? I can see you there because I think you've been in front of a, a congressman or woman or two uh, yes. already. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I've helped a few Congress people, as they say, um, try to get rid of, of all the incentives and, and blah, blah, blah with the annuity industry. Of course, as I told them when they started it, that regardless of the clout that they think they have, they're not going to win. And I was right, but I went through the exercise and had fun, John walking through the Senate building in my annuity man logo sweatsuit tracksuit hats, turn heads, you know, I gave the rock and roll symbol to all the, you know, when I saw people I knew or, or new senators and they, they yeah. just looked at me. But, um, but speaking of that, would you ever run for office, John? Cause I'd vote for you. No, 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 I'm, I'm uh, too old. Some skeleton might roll out, who knows? So I'm, I'm going to hang in there as uh, an annuity architect. You are squeaky clean, you. man. You are squeaky clean. Now, me, I could not run. Okay, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, which leads us to it's a very nice segue into kind of a current battle, battle royale in the annuity industry, as they say, between income riders and deferred income annuities. I always ask people two questions. What do you want the money to contractually do? And when do you want those contractual guarantees to start? If you say, I need lifetime income and I need it to start down the road, whether that's two years, three years, four years, five, whatever that is, we're down to income riders versus deferred income annuities. Johnny, let's get ready to rumble. Let's talk about it. Well, it is a big subject because at the end of the day, uh, when a person buys an annuity, the ultimate goal should be income at some point in the future. And so if that income date is within one year, then that's an immediate annuity and there's no better choice. But if that income date is two years, three years, five years, 10, 15 years out in the future, now you have really three choices. You can buy a DIA, right? The deferred income annuity, which is like a, a SPIA that's deferred out there. It's pretty mm -hmm. inflexible and you've made an irrevocable decision to take income. Mm -hmm. Or you can buy an accumulation product that allows you to take withdrawals for life and you start those anywhere from uh, say a year or two out to well shoot as far as 20 years out those are called so, income riders income rider yeah there's actually four ways to do it john you mentioned two the other one is what i have you know, sweeping the nation you know another tattoo on the back is uh miga to spia Right. Where, you, where you buy a fixed rate annuity and then transfer it to a non-taxable event to an immediate annuity that you shop for. And then the fourth way to do income later is what we're talking about is to, as Mel Gibson said in the movie Braveheart, which is one of your favorites, Sean, I think, where it says, hold, 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 and you buy a SPIA at the time you need income. So those are the four ways. None of the four are better than the other, but if you want to know what the income amounts going to be at that future date, then there's only two ways to know that contractually, and that's DIAs and income riders. But these are commodity products, not one's better than the other. These quotes change like a gallon of milk every seven to 10 days, and you've got to quote all carriers for the highest contractual guarantee is because what John said earlier in the podcast so eloquently is 
you know, these companies are trying to fill tranches of age ranges. And sometimes it's filled up and they'll lower the guarantee not to attract you. And then some need your age range. Really, is that simple? But right now, at the time of this taping, please check it. A lot of the times we're seeing income riders contractually beat the deferred income annuities, not saying they're better. Is there a reason, John, that I don't know about because of that? Because back in the day, that didn't happen. No, I don't think there's a single reason. Uh, the the payout rates that insurance companies deliver are based on uh, several things, and some of it's proprietary to the company. Their experience with uh, their uh, mortality block, their investment returns, the risk they're willing to take, and the uh, the liquidity issues that surround these riders. So, and their expectation on how many people are actually going to buy this rider, and then and then turn it on or activate it. So there's a lot of different things that drive uh, these factors. And then as interest rates have really changed kind of going up over this past year, the immediate annuity SPIA players and the DF uh, pricing people were really quick to react. Uh, we saw rates change weekly with some companies. Mm -hmm. The income rider is it's got a rate and a brochure, it's filed and it's, it's slower to react. So We've seen uh, changes where it kind of flip flop back and forth. And if somebody says, yeah, I don't want to make an irrevocable decision for this income, I'd like to have an option that if I want to quit and dump the income option that I can take a lump sum out, yep. then the income writer is is for that person. I tell people all the time, it's a fork in the road moment. With, with a def deferred income annuity, there's no fork. With a income writer, you can pick up the fork. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you can, you can trademark that if you want to, Johnny. I know that was, that's, uh, you're going to think about but that. Hey, as like you said this. earlier, don't run over the fork. <laughs> exactly. John, I want you to envision something and, and maybe the, this will, this will disturb a lot of people out there when I try to paint this picture. I want you to envision me 90 years old. Okay. The goatee will be what? 12, 14 inches long. At that point in time, I'll be, senile but but still hitting on all cylinders as they say but i'm a 90 year old person johnny and i need to buy annuities uh, what's it look like out there for us 90 year olds by the way i'm never going to reach 90 just letting you know i just but want go to ahead. say no before i you're not getting off the hook that easy i hope you make 90 buddy <laughs> does the world need that though then i hope i'm around to see you at 90 and i can remember who <laughs> you are uh, but oh, yeah, the uh, so as people get older and live longer, they get out there and, you know, and all of a sudden they're, they buy a MIGA at 60, 70, 80, and now all of a sudden they're 90 or 91 years old or later uh, and they need to renew their annuity. Most companies are not accepting, you know, new business transfer business uh, at that age. And the reason is because a lot of people who are each age 90, you know, don't make 91, two, three or four. And the insurance company wants to keep that money for a period of years so they can try to make a profit. So it is important as you purchase MIGAs in your 80s and later to think about what will happen, what are my options to renew or transfer. So uh, a few companies have seen the light and like, hmm, we are getting a lot of people who are in their 85, 90, 90, 90 plus range. So yeah, we, we issued annuity on somebody the other day that was born in 1924, 25. Great so year, John. 90, that was a 90, great year. I don't, I don't know much about that year, but it, the person was 98 years old. So yeah, people could still do that. And you, you might ask, why would anybody want an annuity at that age? It's because they've already got an annuity with a big tax buildup in it. They don't want to pay that tax now. Right. Their kids are in a lower bracket. They, they want them to inherit it and then stretch it out. So yeah, in, annuities for 95 and up are a real thing. Yeah, it's kind of interesting as we age as a population. Um, I do think that companies, because they're, as you said earlier, for profit, they're going to look at that demographic and say, hey, um, we can make money here. And, you know, we always, you know, we, with a lot of the 90 year olds that are entering facilities and et cetera, we buy period certain annuities, et cetera, um, if it's suitable. And typically, obviously, the family members are involved, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, Johnny, as we always do, that was that. I mean, this is great. Do not 
everyone here hang in there because John's got one more thing to say. Um, as I always do, it's a mic drop moment at the end. So envision yourself on stage with Sleep Token. Oh. Yeah. And um, you're going to say something so incredible. Walk away. You just drop the mic. So here we go. Count you down. Five. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on stage and I've got to say something with Sleep Token. All right. No, not about Sleep Token, but about the annuity industry with them in the background with their mask right. on. So five, four, three, two, one, go. Having a fixed portfolio will let you sleep at night while your investments are up and down on the other side of the equation without token every night. There we go. I would say that. Wow. That's phenomenal. If there was just guitar in the background, that would that would do it. Johnny, hang in there with me. I want to thank every single person on all major podcast platforms on the Fun with the Nudies YouTube channel that's looking at John's phenomenal sport coat that he has on and my um, Adidas sweatsuit. I'm sponsored by Adidas, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. The Fun with the Nudies podcast has grown more than I can ever imagine it growing, and we have fun with it. And the reason is it's a non-salesy format in which we talk about annuities and, and inform people. I'm proud of that. Um, as much as we joke and we laugh about it, John and I are very serious about this business, and we're trying to make it a good and safe place for people to go and learn. Um, you can go to my site at theannuityman.com, run quotes 24-7, 365. And if you want to engage with us, please do. But we're not going to chase you. We'll treat you like a pro. And with that being said, Thanks again for joining us, and I'll see you next time on Fun with Annuities.